hope this will be a profitable study. I hope that some of you who have never had any of this information given to you will cherish it, you will hide it in your heart, and that you will mark it down, that you'll memorize it, that you'll learn it, and that you'll not only do all of that, but that you'll tell somebody else about it. Amen. And uh, the Bible talks about uh, teaching faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And uh, certainly we want to uh, pass this along. I know there's some in here, uh, my generation and younger, that have never heard any of this. And uh, it's a, it really opened my eyes. When I went through Brother Brent's Institute over in Romania, and uh, just that, that, I don't go, probably four weeks, five weeks that we went through manuscript evidence, uh, man, it really opened a whole other world of understanding of what's going on out there and the spiritual battle that we're really in concerning God's Word. And uh, so I hope, like I said, I hope it'll be a help to you, and I hope you'll be able to take some of these notes down. And my intention tonight was to have notes to pass out, and I'm sorry that the time this week just did not allow that. So by next week, I will have these notes ready to go, and night number two, next Sunday night, uh, to pass out to you as well, okay? I know that that's always helpful when you have that in front of you, and keep it keep it close by. So, uh, But tonight, if you want to take notes, uh, we'll, we've got about, I don't know, 25 places to turn. You'll be all right. Amen. It'll be fun. So uh, we'll have a good time tonight. All right. 1 Corinthians 14. Let's turn over there where we're taking our text. Or our title, I should say, for this series from. And, you know, I think I told the story a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't know how many here heard it, so I'll, I'll briefly tell it again about... Um, if you saw in the newspaper, we had an ad in the newspaper, and we'll run that ad the whole month of June, try to pique some interest in our community, see if anybody come over and listen to it. Um, but I needed a picture that showed all the different Bible versions on a shelf, and I couldn't find it through Google or Bing or any of that stuff. So I told Valerie, we had to go to Bristol, I said, let's just stop in Books a Million real quick, and I'll take a picture. I know there'll be thousands of Bibles on the shelf. And so we did, and as we got there, in the, in the aisle, there's a young man there, his name was John. We came to find out, and John's probably in his in his early to mid-twenties, and uh, we just struck up a conversation, and I ultimately asked him the question, I said, John, how do you choose which Bible to buy? And he looked at it, and he said, well, I don't know. He said, you know, I just, I've always used the ESV. He got uh, shown that in high school, and he said, that's what I've always bought. And, and I said, well, do you know there's any differences in these Bibles? And he was like, well, I, you know, think they're all the same. Or they all say pretty much the same thing is, you know, what a lot of people will tell you. And so I said, all right. I said, well, get your ESV. And I got the King James out. And we looked at a couple of verses. And we'll, we'll do this in our study. We'll, we'll go through and we'll show you where the different perversions take out things that are very important. Or maybe they add to. Not a whole lot of that. There's a whole lot of subtraction. Not too much adding. But uh, they take out some very important things doctrinally in your Bible. And things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, which we'll talk about here in just a second. And so we looked at Colossians 1.14, which is, it says, uh, in whom we have redemption in, your, in, your, in the right Bible, in the King James Bible, says, whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And, of course, he read his, and it left out through his blood. And I asked him, I said, John, do you think the blood of Jesus Christ is important? He said, well, yeah. And now, mind you, this, this young man grew up in a, in a Baptist church, guys. He doesn't go to one now, but he grew up in one. And then we went to 1 John 5, and I said, John, do you, do you believe in the Trinity? And he said, absolutely. And I said, who are they? And he said, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I said, okay. I said, I need you to read it out of your Bible. And it takes out 1 John 5, 7 and substitutes 5, 8 for 5, 7. And then I read it in the King James, and I said, you know, your Bible doesn't have that in there. And his countenance at that time had fallen, and he just, he'd never been shown that. And so I just left him and, you know, told him if you ever need anything, to holler at me. But, uh, but pray God that helps that young man. And guys, look, there's so many people in this world, so many people in this world have no idea what Satan's trying to do. They have no clue that the hundred plus English versions out there are Satan's attempt to destroy the true English version of God's word in the King James Bible. And so Satan, we know, um, is, is a deceiver, he's an imitator, and he's also, he is the author of confusion. As we're going to read here in 1 Corinthians fourteen thirty three. the Bible says, For God is not the author of confusion, 
but we know Satan sure is. So let's pray tonight, and we'll look at this verse a little bit more, and then we'll jump on into this, okay? Father, we love you. Thank you for the good day you've given us, Lord. It's been a blessing just to be busy in your work. Lord, we thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your word in this King James Bible to our generation. We just ask you to bless it to our hearts. Lord, help us as we, as we go through this. Lord, give us understanding. Lord, please help me to be clear with what's said. And Lord, I, my intention is, is to help someone, Lord, not to hinder someone, be a stumbling block. And so I pray my words will be acceptable in your sight. We thank you, Lord, for the body of evidence that you've left us that proves that your word is in this Bible. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, not only do we need to understand that we have it, Lord, help us to live it. And Lord, help us to be uh, effectual in our lives and all that we do for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So that verse there in 1 Corinthians 14, of course, the chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians is dealing with tongues. And we've, we, I think on Wednesday nights we've covered that, I hope, enough to where everybody understands. Uh, tongues are not the unknown gibberish that goes on in the charismatic movement today. But tongues, when the Bible talks about an unknown tongue, it's talking about a language that is a known language somewhere in the world, just not to those people who are hearing it. And so if I came in here tonight and, and I said, Buenos dias, mi amigos, como estas? How many of you understood what I just said? Okay, how many of you have no idea what I just said? All right, so those of you who have no idea what I just said, if I came in and preached in Spanish tonight, it would do you absolutely no good. Right? And so the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 14, it goes through the list of, of rules for speaking in tongues and other languages in church. And the number one rule is you've got to interpret it. Because if you can't understand what's being said, what good is it? And that whole chapter is about edifying for the church. right? So as, as that whole thing <laughs> causes a lot of confusion, unfortunately, in the charismatic movement, uh, God inserts this verse right here in his perfect word. It says, for God is not the author of confusion, and that's what we always quote, but we've got to keep going because it really shows us the context. It says, but of what? And it says, not only <laughs> is it just, is he the author of peace, it says, as in all what? Churches. And we know the Bible tells us that God wants things done decently and in order in the church. Now hold on. You pick almost any other church in this community to go to. That's not a Baptist church, okay? Cause, but that's, that's going away. Anyway, and you walk in, there will not be just one Bible version used that morning. In fact, a lot of speakers will get up and they will start at the King James... And then they'll go to the New King James because they like the way that that's rendered. And then they'll go to the ASV because they like the way it's put there. And then they'll go over to the RSV and read the footnote on this. Then they'll go to the Message Bible because we've got we to try to connect to the teenagers. So we've got to get it in, in street language. And by the time you get done, you've had six or seven different Bible versions preached to you from the pulpit. Which one's the Word of God? They can't all be the Word of God because they don't all say the same thing. And so here the Bible says, God's not the author of confusion, but of peace. And I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm go ahead, I'm going to just spoil the whole thing, all right? The conclusion of the whole matter, <laughs> we, could, we could not go through the next six weeks of this. Because the bottom line is, you have got to be settled 1,000% in your heart that that King James Bible is the Word of God. And if you'll do that, you'll have peace that passes all understanding. And if you use one of the other versions, you will be like a termite in a wooden yo-yo. That right there is a source of peace. And God said he's not the author of confusion. And so he said, all right, here's my word. It'll give you peace in the churches of the saints. It was never God's intention to have a hundred different Bible versions out there, all claiming to have parts of his word in it. Never his intention. And by the way, we might as well go ahead and say this. Uh, the King James Bible, maybe I should say it this way, the authorized King James Bible. It's the only Bible that has that name. The authorized King James Bible does not 
contain the word of God. Right. So how can you say that? It doesn't contain it. It is the word of God. See, the other versions, and I'm going to read you the NIV preface tonight before we're done. The other versions say they contain the Word of God. But some of it may be and some of it might not be. And they leave that open. You'll see that. But your King James Bible, it is the Word of God. It doesn't just contain it. It is. All right. um, Let's go to Philippians 4. All right. Look, we're going to turn all over the Bible tonight, so you can lose your place and it'll be fine. All right, Philippians 4. Did I tell you? I didn't even tell you the conclusion. Yeah, I sort of did. The conclusion of the whole matter is a five letter word. It's called faith. And anybody in this room that has put their faith in this Bible will tell you it is 1,000% without argument God's word. Because he proves himself true when we put our faith in him according to this Bible. That tower that we dedicated today and that transmitter and that studio, that radio station, that is all God proving himself and that his word in the King James Bible is 1,000% true. Because we claim the promises in this book, and it came to fruition. You'll never convince me that another Bible is God's word, ever. I've seen it, I've seen it too much in my life, seen his hand proven mighty and strong and true from putting my faith in this Bible. You'll never find another one. All right, Philippians 4, we know the verses, verse 6. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto who? You believe God? (laughs) Go back to this morning's message. You believe in God? You believe what the Bible says about God? You trust in Jesus for the salvation of your soul? Okay, that same faith that we exercise for salvation, that same faith that we exercise in that God exists and that he is, and is a reward of them that diligently, diligently seek him, that same faith has to be applied to his word. And it says, <clears throat> let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When did the peace come? When the faith was exercised in prayer. And that'll be a pattern all the way throughout your Bible. Somebody exercises faith in God, peace. Look at John chapter 14. John 14. John chapter 14 and... Verse, looking at verse 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, peace I leave with you. And here's, here's the thing. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. And so we're talking about exercising faith in God's word. But who is the word of God? Jesus Christ. And he said, it's my peace that I'm going to give you. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And, and we believe and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you get the peace of Jesus Christ in your heart through the Holy Ghost. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Right? It says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Oh. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be what? (laughs) Come on, listen. If you hadn't grown up in this church and you hadn't been at this church any length of time and you had to walk into a Books a Million or Barnes & Noble and find find a Bible, come on, listen. At one level, you'd be troubled because you'd have no idea. you just sort of pick the one that has the best cover on it. you judge a book by its cover and you'd go on, right? He said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why is, it, why is it that we are so sure that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Because the, right, the Bible says so. 
Why are we so sure that if we repent of our sins and put our faith and trust in Jesus that we'll be saved and born again? Why are we so certain about that? Because the Bible says so. Why are we so certain that once we're saved, no man, including ourselves, is able to pluck us out of Jesus' hand or the Father's hand and they're one, as the Bible says in John 10? Why are we so sure about that? Because it's what the Bible says. Why are we so sure that one day Jesus Christ is going to come back in the clouds and the trump's going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise first? Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with him so shall we ever be with the Lord for all of eternity. Why are we so sure about that? Because the Bible says so. Why are we so sure about what's going to happen in Revelation in the, in the seven year tribulation period of Jacob's trouble and then Jesus Christ coming back to all of his saints and the battle of Gog and Magog and the thousand year millennial reign and then all of eternity, New Jerusalem is going to come down and there we are with Jesus Christ in that new city for all of eternity. Why are we so certain about that? Because the Bible says so. But it's not just any Bible. It's the King James Bible. You know why there's such a stink about all the different perversions out there taken away through his blood out of Colossians 1.14? Listen, because if you don't have the King James Bible, you don't have through his blood. You know what a lot of the new Bibles will, will tell, tell you and those that promote the new Bibles will tell you? They'll say, well, you know, you can find those, those doctrines that are in the King James. You can find them in the new Bibles. The problem is... If you didn't have a King James Bible, you wouldn't know about a whole lot of those doctrines. Because they're not in the new Bibles. Anyway. God's the author of peace. And he said, my peace I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And he said, not as the world giveth. What's the world's peace? What's that? Yeah, sin for a season, right? Oh, it's fine. It's okay. The ones that say the new perversions are just as good as the King James Bible, who are they making the authority? They're making themselves the authority. And that's what we preached on this morning. That's what we're going to get to in here in just a minute. Guys, the authority is in God's word, not in what another man says. Okay, and I'm going to come back to that. All right, let's go. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. Probably about week three, week four, somewhere in there, we'll have a comparative study on some of these very important verses in your King James Bible and how they are, they are either deleted Completely changed, otherwise totally destroyed in the new perversions. Okay, and we'll show that to you and what they, what they say differently. And a lot of people of the new, uh, the, that are proponents of these new perversions will say, you know, they say the same thing, basically say the same thing. And I guess now's a good time to put this in here. Listen, God's word, as it was said this morning, God's word is made up of shocker. Words, And we're going to see here in a minute that God said he would preserve the words. And what all the new perversions do is they claim to preserve the message. Well, the message is comprised by the words. So if you don't have the same words, you don't have the same what? Okay. It's simple, right? But they, they try, Satan tries to twist that thing. He tries to be real subtle about that thing. All right, 2 Timothy 3.16, most of us can quote it, right? All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God and is profitable, thank God for that, for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. What's the next word? Throughly furnished. You've got to watch a lot of the new even, even the King James Bibles, guys, you've got to watch. Uh, Zondervan Publishers is one of them. You've got to watch. Um, Thomas Nelson's another one. They will change that word to thoroughly. That's not the same word as throughly. When the Bible says that you are, the man of God is throughly furnished, 
That means that the scripture that I, okay, let's put it in, my, in context of myself. I study throughout the week the Word of God, the inspired Word of God, and I, I get a message put together that God lays on my heart, and when I stand up here, I pray with everything that's in me for the Holy Ghost to work through me to help you. But the new Bibles are going to take that dependence of God out of there, and they're going to say, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and you're thoroughly equipped. It's all on the man. Hey, listen, I'm nothing aside of God working through me. Hope you understand that. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All right. We're going to look at inspiration next time in depth. Um, if I ask you, you know, to, to define the word inspiration, probably uh, any of us that have had any sort of teaching on this, we're, we're probably going to say God breathed. Okay. And, and yes, that's part of it, um, but that's not all of it. Okay. So we'll, we'll get to that next time. And we're talking about inspiration, all right? Um, so we know, number one, God inspired his word. Number two, turn to 1 John 5. 1 John 5. Number two, God wants you to know his word. He does not want it to be a mystery to you today. That's why he's given us the complete canon of his word in scripture in 66 books. Now, back in the Old Testament, those prophets, they would prophesy about the coming of the Messiah, and most of them probably didn't have any idea what they were talking about. That was the inspiration of God. Okay? And then it talks about over there in the New Testament, some things were hard to be understood, right? And that they have a, a, a veil on their, on their heart and on their face until they believe. We talked about this morning, you believe, you get understanding, that veil's lifted, right? But today, we have the complete revelation of God to this generation preserved in the King James Bible this is what he wants you to know. In 1 John 5, 9, it says, If we receive the witness of men, <laughs> the witness of who is greater? Yea, and let God be true and every man a liar. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. Okay, so everything that your King James Bible says about Jesus Christ is what God the Father wanted you to know about His Son. And so it's not okay when the new perversions start messing around with what the Bible's supposed to say about Jesus. Because God the Father said, I want you to know this about my Son. And when they change what, what God the Father said this about His Son, they have changed the Word of God. And we're going to see that next. That's a bad situation to be in. Ten, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. <laughs> I would hate to insinuate that God's a liar. I wouldn't want to be on that end of things. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may. What's the word? And how many of us have knocked on a door, have witnessed to a co-worker, have witnessed to a family member and said, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And they came back with, nobody can know that. How many have heard that before? That is a lie of Satan. You can know if you're going to go to heaven or not. And God wants you to know whether or not you're going to go to heaven or not. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The, the lie of Satan is... Yea, hath God said, do you really think that's what he meant? Satan's whole mode of operation is to cast doubt on the word of God. And if he can get you to doubt the word of God, your final authority in your life is shattered. But by faith exercised in the word of God, what do you get? Peace. All right, uh, let's go to <clears throat> Psalm 119, 1 Peter 1, and Isaiah 40. Y'all do that. Psalm 119, Isaiah 40, and 1 Peter 1. Not only did God inspire His Word, not only does God want you to know His Word... But that word that he wants you to know is forever settled in heaven. OK. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's go to Psalm 119 first. Psalm 119.89, the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And I like verse 90 with it. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. See that? Let's go to uh, Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40 and verse 8, this is quoted over in the New Testament. But it says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand, how long? Forever. First Peter. First Peter 1. <laughs> those, that, those that went to Brother Dean just today, you got part 1 and part 2 of this already. So anyway. It's good, we'll get reminded. First Peter 1, verse 23, the Bible says, Being born again. You born again tonight? Here's how it happened. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Amen? What is that incorruptible seed? It's the word of God, which what? Liveth and abideth forever. And it was rightly said yesterday when you see that, and we'll talk about the language of the King James, okay, before this is over with. Uh, Dr. Gail Rippinger has done a phenomenal job of putting a book out talks about the these and the thous and the yous and the yees. Look, don't let that confuse you. Don't let somebody tell you you need a new Bible that doesn't have the these and the thous and the yous and the yees because those are inspired of God, man. You need those in there. All right, anyway, it says, <clears throat> that liveth and abideth forever. When you see that ETH ending, that means perpetually. That means God's word is going to live perpetually. It's alive. We know that, right? It's quick and it's powerful. Sharpening a two-edged sword. It's going to live forever. It's going to abide forever. All right. Um, let's go to Psalm 33 now. Psalm 33 and Proverbs 30. Psalm 33, I'm kind of giving you a shotgun start tonight, okay? Sort of hitting all the little high points here, and then we're going to delve into some things in depth in the coming weeks. Psalm 33 and Proverbs 30. All right, but Mark's favorite, standing on the promises verse, Psalm 33, 4, says, For the Lord, word of the Lord is right. And all his works are done in truth. Not only is God's word inspired, not only does he want you to know his word, not only is his word forever settled in heaven, incorruptible, living and abiding forever, but God's word is just plain right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just right. Look, look, at, look at Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30. So that's well, really deep. Well, you know, wondering which one's the right word of God. Proverbs 30, verse 5, it says, Every word of God is pure. Not only are they right words, they're pure words. Look back at Psalm 12. Psalm 12, and we'll get more detail on these verses later down the study. Psalm 12, verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And that purified seven times is so very important. And I'll show you how your King James Bible was purified seven times. There's a whole lot to numbers in the Bible. And I'll show you how that's the case uh, later down in this study. But we, we see that God's word is right. We see that God's word is pure. And then we're right there at Proverbs 30, verse 6. Here's, uh, what is that, number 3, 4, 5, whatever it is. Now 6, whatever it is. But God warned against changing his word. Because his word is forever settled in heaven. There's a grave warning against trying to change his word. And verse 6 it says... Proverbs 30, verse 6. Is that where you were? Or were you in Psalm? Doesn't matter. You're in Proverbs 30 now, right? Amen. Proverbs 30, verse 6 says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a... Let God be true, and every man a... Anybody that tries to change that Bible is a liar. All right, Revelation 22. Is it not curious to you? 
that your Bible starts out in Genesis 3 with Satan questioning God's word. But before he ever questioned it, you have what God said. Let there be light. Right? Let the waters bring forth life. Right? All, all the, let, let, there be, let there be grass. Right? So God, God spoke the creation into existence. And you go all the way through your Bible with men trying to change God's word and doubt God's word. And yea, hath God said all the way through till you get to Revelation. And if you look, well, look at Revelation. Well, no, no, don't do that. Look at Revelation 22. It says in verse 18, Revelation 22, 16, excuse me. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have set mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Well, what is that, Lord? It's the Bible. It's his word. And it says, I am the root of the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And come down to verse 18, it says, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. Okay, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Your King James Bible was translated in 1611, and it was perfected, <laughs> say that, and I'll explain it later, 1769, I believe it is. Bless you. We're going, to go, we're going to get into this, but the first mass-produced perversion of your Bible was in 1881 by two heretics by the name of Westcott and Hort. When they translated their corrupt, revised, standard version, you see where that's going? A universal religion, revised, standard, right? You see all that? They had to translate Revelation twenty two, eighteen, And what's it say? Look at it. I testify that every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. Okay. That was West Cotton Hort. If any man shall add unto, what's it say? These things. God shall add on him the plagues that are written in the book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the holy things which are written in this book. And you know what they did? They went right through that stop sign at a thousand miles an hour. God had a great warning against trying to change his word. All right. That's really encouraging, isn't it? Next, God will bless you for trusting and living according to his word. Let's go back to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 7. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Before this study is over with, we'll talk about the fruits, uh, the spiritual fruits that have been produced to the glory of Jesus Christ by the King James Bible. That no other version of the Bible has even come close to producing. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. You see all these benefits from trusting and living and obeying God's word? The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold... Sweeter also than honey, amen, Brother Rick, and the honeycomb. Moreover, watch, by them is thy servant, what's the word? Warned. You know what gets taken out of a lot of the new perversions? God's warnings against sin. Well, that's convenient, isn't it? Yeah, well, we'll get more into that. And in keeping of them, there is great, what? Reward. Great reward. All through your Bible, God laid out to Israel the, the if-then pattern. 
And the if-then pattern is this. If, <laughs> nation of Israel, you will keep my word and obey my statutes and keep my judgments, then I will bless you, nation of Israel. But if, nation of Israel, you go against my statutes and my word and my law, then I will curse you, nation of Israel. And in the New Testament believer, the Lord Jesus Christ says, if you'll repent, I'll, I'll save you. But if you die in your sins... Then you'll go to hell. The if-then policy, the if-then pattern has been all throughout Scripture, highlighting and undergirding man's choice. (laughs) If, then. So many of God's promises are conditional. They're conditional upon you and I choosing in our heart God and choosing His Word and choosing to trust Him and choosing to love Him. Or choosing not to love Him and choosing to go our own way and choosing to walk in our own paths and choosing to trust in our own righteousness. And God's sitting there and He's saying, if you'll do it my way, then I'll bless you. But if you do it your way, then you'll be cursed. And it's all throughout your Bible. But it all comes down to, are you trusting and believing and obeying what God said in His Word? All right. Now, Psalm 12. A few pages back. So, God inspired His Word. God wants you to know His Word. God's Word is forever settled in heaven. God's Word is right. God warned against changing His Word. And God will bless you for trusting and living according to His Word. And the honest, the honest person has to say, then which Bible is God's Word? Because they can't all be God's Word because they don't all say the same thing. And if you look at Psalm 12, you say, well, how can you even ask that question? Is there a copy of God's word in existence today? Why, why would you even think that? Well, the Bible says in Psalm 12, 6, it says the words of the Lord are pure words, the silver trying the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Verse 7, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation. How long? What is the them? The them are God's words. And every perversion of the Bible changes the them to us. And that's convenient for them. (laughs) But look at the whole chapter. Verse 1. Help, O Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They, what's the word? Speak. Vanity. Every one with his neighbor with flattering what? Lips, with a double heart do they, what? Speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering, what? Lips. And the, that, proud things, who have said with our, come on, everybody, come on, come on, let's all get in it. With our, will we prevail our, or our own, who is Lord over us, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in the safety from him that puffeth at him, the, of the Lord are pure, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep, O Lord, thou shalt preserve from this generation forever, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Somebody tell me, what is being discussed in that chapter? The words of men and the words of God. And they're in contrast. And the whole chapter is talking about the flattering lips and those that speak vanity and speak with a double heart. And with our tongue we will prevail and our lips are our own and they're proud and they're haughty. And God said, you know what, your words are going to pass away, guys. But my words are pure words and I'm going to preserve them forever. From this generation forever. All right, so... Who wrote Psalm 12? Not a trick question. David, right? David lived, what, 3,000 years ago, something like that. Somewhere in that neighborhood. When the Holy Spirit inspired David to write, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. We know God's word is forever settled in heaven, right? What language was David writing in? Hebrew. We have a New Testament. And our New Testament's initial inspired language was Greek. So God preserved his word in Hebrew. 
God preserved his word in Greek. Why is there a problem believing and understanding that God has preserved his word in English? There is no problem with that. It's always God, God's mode to have his word preserved in one language upon the earth. It was Hebrew because the Israelites were God's chosen people. He chose Greek of that day because it was widely spoken all across the known world at that time. And when he put his word preserved in the English language in 1611, God put his word in the trade language of the world of 2017. Do you realize the number of countries that teach English as a primary or secondary language? It is a majority of the world. Do you understand that when a pilot gets his license for Delta, U.S. Air, whatever, and they fly internationally, guess what language they speak in over the controls? English. Guess what a ship's captain, when they come into port in Japan or South America or Asia or Europe or the United States, guess what language they speak? You say, that's a coincidence, not on your life. God knew what he was doing, and when he put it in English, he put it in, listen, he put it in English so the whole world could know what he said to mankind. And he said, here it is. And so we believe, without a doubt, God's word is preserved in the King James Bible in the English language. And we'll come through all of that, that inspiration and preservation, all that kind of stuff next time. Okay, But that, that gives you a, a wet whistle, I hope. All right. Now, Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5. Y'all are listening well. Isaiah 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Verse 20, the Bible says this, Isaiah 5, 20. Woe unto them that call evil, what? And good, what? Okay. So, is evil good? No. Is good evil? No. Is every Bible version the same? Then things that are different cannot be the same. But Satan will tell you, oh, it's all generally the same. Problem is that generally leaves out a whole lot of really important stuff. (laughs) So very simply, things that are different are not the same. Just because it says Holy Bible on the cover does not mean it contains God's word. Just because it says Holy Bible on the cover does not mean it is God's word. Right? All right, now, let's go to John 10. We talked about a little bit this morning about how... How the religious crowd, and by the way, that, that's who's at the root of all the Bible perversion stuff, is the religious crowd. <laughs> there, there, look, there's no, there is no idolatrous worshipers trying to, well, okay, sorry, I've I got to take that all the way back because the Catholic Church. Uh, there, there are no heathens out there trying to corrupt your Bible. Listen, Satan, <laughs> Satan's masterful deception and, and confusion is not found at the bars, it's found in the churches. And you've got to be so very careful who you listen to. And I've got to, as a pastor, I've got to be so very careful who I have in to preach God's word. And the men that we have in to preach God's word, they have no question in their heart. They are firmly settled that the King James Bible is God's word. But if you're not careful, some of our good, right, righteous brethren around this area, even in this county, they'll tell you, yeah, I believe the King James Bible, but then they'll try to correct it with the Greek. They'll tell you, I believe the King James Bible, but I think this word ought to have been translated and rendered this way. And listen, if you have those questions and those uncertainties, you are not settled, you are confused. John chapter 10, the religious crowd always questioned three things. Number one, they questioned Jesus' identity as the Son of God. 
They questioned his authority and they questioned his deity as God manifest in the flesh. And don't you know all three of those things are still being questioned today? And don't you know it's just those three things that happen to be attacked by all the perversions of the Bible? <laughs> without, without, without change. All right, John 10, 24. <clears throat> Bible says, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. <laughs> and it's kind of like beating your head against the wall, by the way. Well, anyway. 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not. That's pretty plain, isn't it? <laughs> I told you it was. You didn't believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Flip over to Matthew 7. Constantly questioning, who are you, Jesus? Tell us plainly. And he says, I told you and you don't believe me. And so it kind of comes down to this tonight. Your pastor is standing in front of you telling you the King James Bible is God's perfect, inerrant, inspired, preserved, infallible word of God. And you've either got to believe that or you're going to question it. But remember, there's great benefits and rewards to putting faith in God's word. All right, Matthew 7, 29. It says, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You know, one of the reasons that our church is not packed out is because the authority of God's word in the King James Bible has been preached, I think, probably since the inception of this church. And this church has been around for 80 years. This church was here when the revivals of the 40s and 30s and 50s and 60s were sweeping through America. And this church saw great growth and, and solid numbers into the 80s and 90s. And then we started to see the last days take effect. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ is not going to come unless there be a falling away first. And we started to see the Laodicean church age come in in full force. And, fo and people thinking, you know, I'm okay to be lukewarm with God. and I, I'm good. I don't need all that church stuff. And the Bible also says that in the latter days, they will not endure what? Sound doctrine. That is the practical preaching from God's word on how you and I ought to live our life. And you know what? As a pastor and as a preacher, I can stand, open the Bible and say, Thus saith the Lord with all the authority of God. And the bottom line is a lot of people don't like that. Because <laughs> they'll sit there and they'll say, Well, who do you think you are? And you know what that proves? Their authority is not that word. Their authority is somebody else. So who's your authority tonight? All right, uh, Matthew 21. Of course, Jesus Christ taught with authority. He was the Word of God. He is the Word of God. Everything he said was pure and right and good and, all, and righteous altogether, all that stuff. Matthew 21, verse 23. 21, 23 says, And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came into, unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority... Doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? Right? See what they're doing? They're questioning all the bits. <laughs> Keep going. Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Whence was it? Now watch. Here, here's the crux of the whole matter. From heaven or of who? Boy, he, he, he painted him right in the corner, didn't he? Look what they said. And they reasoned with themselves, that's always a dangerous thing to do, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why then, why did you not then believe him? But if we say of men, <laughs> we fear the people. Well, that'll cause you a lot of problems too, Psalm 118, 8. For all hold John as a prophet, and they answered Jesus, said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. There'll be people, probably even your own family members, have already done this to you and to me. And friends and neighbors. Well, why do y'all go to church three times a week? Well, because the Bible says, not I like my church, although that's a good answer. Right? Well, I've got nothing else better to do. No, that's not, that's not right either. No, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not 
the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, especially as you see the day approaching. You see, when you get asked the, why do you do what you do for God? It's an opportunity to pull it back to God's word because that's our authority, right? It, it's, our, it's our final authority, as Bill Gibbs says, in all matters of faith and practice, right? Well, why do you guys build a float and preach every single 4th of July? People are getting tired of hearing you do that because the Bible says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'll never forget this. Uh, Brother Joel Logan, probably the fir- first year or two I was down in Florida at the land of Brother Knox's Bible Conference. Every uh, third day, last day of the Bible Conference, they take people out and they, and they street preach. That's their, their normal day for public evangelism. And man, there's like 100 people out on the streets, all different places in the land. And uh, we're walking out to this main intersection. Everybody's got their signs, right, walking out through there. And uh, I'm, I'm walking with Brother Joel and Brother Brent, these guys, and, and we're going right through there. And there's some, some woman pulls through the intersection. She rolls her window down. And she says, where's your permit? And I'll never forget what Brother Joel said. He said, Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the authority. What authority do you have to be here? Well, maybe none in your jurisdiction, but God said, yeah, we ought to obey rather than I just don't see what good it is. Look, nobody may ever get saved by the evangelistic efforts of this church, but we had better do it based on the authority of God's word and be obedient to the word of God, and he'll bless us if we do that. It's not about numbers. It's not about broadcasting these these wonderful results. It's not about that. It's about am I being obedient to the word of God And acting upon the authority that we've been given from God's word. Look at Mark 13. By the way, God did tell you to pay your taxes. So let's not get on that. that. Amen. (laughs) Get that on record. You get that, Dad? Got it recorded. All right, good. Amen. Mark 13, verse 32 says, But of that day... That hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. He says, 33, take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave what? Now, there, there's some guys out there that will twist that and rest that and say that you've got power over devils and unclean spirits to cast them out. And I'm just telling you right now, you better not mess with that stuff. Those things will whip your tail, man. God did not give you and I, as New Testament church believers, the authority over unclean spirits. He gave that to the apostles. But He sure gave you and I an authority. There's your authority for living a life that's pleasing in my sight. He gave Him authority. It says, To every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch you there for. All right. Uh, Titus 2. Titus 2, real quick. Real quick. Boy, time is flying. I got up here and didn't think I was going to have enough material to do a whole lot tonight. Titus 2. The Bible says God is not the author of confusion, but of peace in all the churches of the saints. And we believe he has preserved his word to this generation in the King James Bible. So therefore, because we have that, verse 15, Titus 2.15 says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all what? Now, I try to be very careful when I get up here and preach. If I'm going to give you my opinion, I try to tell you this is my opinion. But otherwise, we try to keep everything inside the bounds of God's word because that's the authority. I'm not the authority. God's word's the authority. I'm just the messenger to stand and give it out. And and hopefully God is going to work through me, amen, to minister to your hearts with his word. Not my words. All right, so who is your authority? And and then we go to Genesis 3. Go over to Genesis 3 real quick. Boy, y'all know these verses, but 
That's fine. Genesis 3. We know God gave Adam and Eve a commandment. That was his word. (laughs) And Satan comes along. In verse 1 of chapter 3, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat every tree of the garden. And what's the punctuation mark at the end of that sentence? Question mark. And you've got to watch the people today in our society and in our churches that when something is preached out of God's word or something is read out of God's word and they say, well, I just think. What they're doing is they're trying to make themselves the authority instead of letting God be the authority. And by the way, if someone is your authority, what are you supposed to do to them? Submit to them. You know what the problem in today's churches are? Nobody wants to submit to that book. But I'll tell you what, you and I, our lives will be so much better off if we'll humbly and lovingly submit to every word that's in that King James Bible. Your life will be wonderful. You say, I'll get persecuted. Praise God, you get to suffer a little bit of what Jesus suffered for you. Yea, hath God said, question mark. And so when a new version comes out, and they say, we realize, us group of scholars, the need for a new version in modern English Who have they just made the authority? When a pastor or a preacher gets in the pulpit and he says, reads a verse and he says, now in the original Greek, this word was this and this, and it can be translated a number of different ways. And it's unfortunate the King James Bible translators translated it this way. It should have been this way. What's he just done? He's just changed the authority from God to himself. How many of you all know Greek? Hmm. So if I came in and said, this word in the Greek is this, what would you do? Oh, okay. (laughs) This church would turn you off. What would most people do? (laughs) Oh, wow. He's smart. He studied today. Hmm. He's got to be right. You wouldn't know if I was right or pulling your leg from one way or another. Because you don't know Greek. And the Bible said, if you're going to talk in unknown tongues, other languages, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to interpret to the edification of the church, not the confusion of the church. Because when you say that this word in Greek should have been translated this way, what's it do? It casts doubt on the King James Bible. (laughs) By the way, they got into talking about Strong's Concordance there yesterday. If you've got a Strong's Concordance... Uh, you're, you're fine using it as a concordance, but in the back there's a Greek concordance. You should take super glue and glue every one of those pages together. Don't even go there. Because here's the deal. A lot of these guys will talk about, well, we believe the Bible is God's word in the originals. Okay, well the original Old Testament was in what language? Okay, where are they? Well, if we don't know, then either they're not important to God or he broke his word and he didn't preserve it. All right. New Testament was in what language? Okay. Where's that? And Hebrew. Where are the originals in Greek? Well, if God didn't preserve his word somehow to this generation, then he broke his word, didn't he? If it's not here somewhere. Strong's Concordance, Greek Concordance. When he puts those Greek words in there and he tells you the definitions of those words, who's the authority? Mr. Strong. When, when the other commentators on the Greek language tell you that this word in the Greek is, or this word out of your King James Bible is this in the Greek, and here's the other meanings for it, who's the authority? They are. 
And so many pastors and preachers, I think unknowingly, just, just doing what they've been taught somewhere else, get in the pulpit and they say, and that word in the Greek, and it means this and it should be that. And they're telling you a heretic's opinion of God's word. They don't even know it. So why do you stand so strong on that? Because God preserved his word perfectly, inerrantly, infallibly in the English language, in the King James Bible, and there's no need to look at the Greek. Learn the English. <laughs> there's no need to look at the Hebrew. Learn the English. And trust God. Aren't you glad you have a Bible? Pope Francis visiting Portugal uh, on whatever date that was, May 12th, uh, was there to honor and canonize two shepherd children who saw visions of the Virgin Mary 100 years ago. Thousands of pilgrims from around the world are joining the pontiff in Fatima, a Catholic shrine town, to celebrate the centenary of the apparitions and canonize the children. The children's visions 100 years ago is regarded as one of the most important events of the 20th century Catholic Church. I would really hate for my church to be based on hallucinations by two children that were smoking pot working the sheep. The two children being canonized are brother and sister, Francisco and and Yahinta Marto, who were ages nine and seven. At the time of their visions, their apparitions are said to have started on May 13th, 1917, while they were grazing sheep. I think they were grazing on something too. Francisco... Jaquinta, now watch, and their cousin, Lucia dos Santos, said they saw the Madonna, that ought to send chills down your back, who told them three secrets. Apocalyptic messages foreshadowing World War II, the rise and fall of communism, the death of a pope, and hell. The Virgin Mary asked them to learn to read and write and pray for sinners. How nice. Francisco died of influenza two years later. That's not odd. That's God. Followed by his sister, Jaquinto, of the same illness the next year. Lucia dos Santos, who became a nun and is credited for sharing the story of the apparitions and gaining believers, is on track for beautification herself. You understand these people that they are, they are lifting up and idol, uh, idolizing, according to the Catholic belief system, they're not even in heaven yet. They're trying to get them out of purgatory. All right. Sister Lucia's calls for beautification, the first step to becoming a saint, began in 2008, just three years after her death. <laughs> When Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI waived, now watch, waived the normally required five-year waiting period. So if you die in the Catholic Church, you've got a five-year waiting period in purgatory before you even get prayed for. But he waived that for these kids. Fatima has long been associated with St. Paul, St. John Paul II, who credited the Madonna whew, for saving his life in 1981 when he was shot on Fatima's feast day. May 13th in St. Peter's Square. John Paul visited Fatima a year later and said, Because on this exact date, last year in St. Peter's Square in Rome, there was an attempt on the life of you, Pope, which mysteriously coincided with the anniversary of the first vision of Fatima. (laughs) With all of us forming one heart and soul, I will entrust you to Our Lady, all capitalized, asking her to whisper to each one of you, My Immaculate Heart will be your refuge and the path that leads you to God. The traditions of men taught as doctrine. Cunningly devised fables. Religion. I'm glad I've got God's word. And I don't have to worry about some pope trying to pray me out of a place that I don't want to be, but I've got to wait five years before that. That's insanity. You know what that is? That's called bondage. Religious bondage. All right. We know Satan's mode of operation is to cast doubt on God's word. 
It's to deceive according to God's word. If you remember when he tested and tempted Christ in the wilderness in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, that he only quoted part of the scriptures, he only quoted part of the word of God, and he rested those scriptures. And that's what his crowd is doing today. They're resting the scriptures. They only take part of what they want to hear out of God's word, and the part they don't want to hear, they just cut it out and, and put it away somewhere. And then his mode of operation, so number one, doubt. Number two, deception. Number three, distortion. He twists and he distorts what God really said. Now look at Matthew 13, and then I'm going to read you the preface of the NIV and get your blood boiling for the next time, and then we're going to go home. Amen. All right, Matthew 13. Matthew 13. As we said before, Satan's game is an imitation game. He wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped as God. And so he's going to do everything he can to make people think that he is God. And that he's going to sit on the throne as the Antichrist. We understand that as Satan manifests in the flesh. But Matthew 13, the Bible tells us this, verse 25. Matthew 13, 25 tells us how Satan operates. Thank God for his word. Look at verse 24. It says, Another parable put he forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while the men slept, his enemy came and sowed, what? Tares among the wheat. And went his way. Now the enemy obviously is Satan. It says, but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, it appeared, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, dost thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then we go gather them up? He said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, a picture of eternal damnation, but, the ga- but gather the wheat in my barn. And anything about, if you know anything about agriculture, those tares and that wheat, they look similar. In fact, they look almost identical until you break open that wheat ca- uh, husk or cast or whatever it is, and it's got the wheat seed in there, and the tare, guess what it's got in there? Nothing. It's empty. It's vain. And Satan's whole mode of operation is to try to get people to bite into something that's religious looking, that looks good, that feels good, that appears right, that looks okay, but it's empty and it's vain inside. And he doesn't want you and I to have the real thing. But God does. And God's greater than that old rascal is. So his game's an imitation game. All right? Probably the most compelling piece of evidence for why the King James Bible is the Word of God is the attack that has been lowered on that Bible. If the NIV was God's Word, why isn't everybody attacking the NIV? If the RSV was God's Word, why isn't everybody attacking the RSV? If the ESV was God's word, why isn't Satan attacking the ESV? Why is it that every new perversion of the Bible has to claim its superiority to that old King James? Because Satan wants to destroy God's word, and you can guarantee, take it to the bank, whatever it is that he's fighting, God's for it. All right. Let me give you this thought and then we'll read this. We believe that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh, yes? No problem with that. And so you have supernatural and natural working together. John 1.1 tells us that Jesus' name is the Word of God. So why is it so hard for us to accept and believe And just get settled in our heart that a supernatural God could use a natural man to pen his word, to inspire through that man. Why do we have a problem thinking that same supernatural God could not overcome the fallibility of natural man to preserve his word? Why is that such a problem? All right. 
Those of you that have had Brother Brent's stuff, just bite a pen or something. And those of you that haven't, uh, you'll bite one by the time we're done with this study. All right, I'm, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I'm going to read the parts that I have highlighted, which is quite a lot, but anyway. All right, here's the preface to the New International Version from 1984. Okay. It says, the New International Version is a completely new translation. Does that mean it's re-inspired? It says, of the Holy Bible made by over 100 scholars, and we'll get into how the King James Bible was translated working directly from the best available Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts. And when we get into the the manuscript evidence on the family of texts that your King James Bible was taken from versus what the perversions were taken from, it it just blows your mind. They are not taken from the best available texts. They're taken from the best corrupt texts. And I'll, I'll tell you all that later. Okay. All right. This ought to scare you. It had its beginning in 65 when several years of exploratory study by committees from the Christian Reformed Church. Anytime you see the word reformed, that means it's Calvinistic. So a Calvinistic church is behind the NIV translation. It says uh, that these group of people... uh, uh, met at Palos Heights, Illinois, and concurred in the need for a new translation of the Bible in contemporary English. Well, why? (laughs) Why can't we just learn what God gave us, right? It says, this group, though not made up of official church representatives, was transdenominational. That ought to be your second chill down your spine. Its conclusion was endorsed by a large number of leaders from many denominations. Well, they can't all be right. The Catholic Church does not agree with the Presbyterian Church, does not agree with the Methodist Church, does not agree with the Baptist Church, does not agree with the, with the Charismatic Church, does not agree with the Church of Christ, does not agree with the JWs and the more. None of it agrees. But they got all these representatives together and they came to a conclusion on a Bible Can you imagine what kind of mess that has to be to please all those people? You have to have catechisms. You have to have water baptism upheld in your Bible. The JWs don't believe that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. So you've got to have a Bible that takes away the deity of Jesus Christ. You've got to take away all the essential doctrines that we hold in the King James Bible to be true to please all those different people. And if that's your committee to translate the Bible, that's insanity. But that's exactly what they did. It says this group was a self-governing body. That's convenient. Of distinguished scholars. Is anybody in here a distinguished scholar? You know why they say that? Try to make you think that they know what they're saying. You don't know what they're saying. I think God said that his wisdom was foolishness with men. And so we're wiser by trusting God than the scholars. It says it has an international scope. That ought to send chills down your back. That they were from many denominations, including Anglican, Assemblies of God, Baptist, Brethren, Christian, Reformed, Church of Christ, Evangelical, Free, Lutheran, Mennonite, Methodist, Nazarene, Presbyterian, Wesleyan, and other churches. Listen, listen. Help to safeguard the translation from sectarian bias. In fact, it did just the opposite. (laughs) All right, I'm not going to read that. They make this claim. It may well be that no other translation has been made by a more thorough process of review and revision from committee to committee than this one, except the King James. And you'll see that when we get there. It says, uh, this new international version, it would be an accurate translation and one that would have clarity and literary quality and so prove suitable for public and private reading, teaching, preaching, memorizing, and liturgical use. I'm sorry, but I can use the King James in all those ways. The translators were united. (laughs) It says, at the same time, they have striven. Listen, listen. At the same time, they have striven. Listen, listen. 
They have striven for more than a word-for-word translation. Now, hold on. You know what the whole point of translating is? Is to translate word-for-word. But these guys just told you, we're not interested in translating the Bible word-for-word. Remember what I told you? The words of God are inspired. The words of God are pure. The words of God are preserved, not the message. But they said, we want to do more than a word-for-word translation because thought patterns and syntax differ from language to language. Faithful communication of the meaning of the writers of the Bible demands frequent modifications. What they're telling you is their scholarship supersedes God's authority and they've got to do something that God wasn't able to do. That's what they're saying. It says frequent modifications and constant regard for the contextual meaning of words. And so they submitted their translation to stylistic consultants. And samples of the translation were tested for clarity and ease of reading by various kinds of people, young and old, highly educated and less well-educated, ministers and laymen. And I don't have time to go off on my rant on laymen again. The problem with that is, and and this is what you'll hear, all the new perversions, they'll tell you it's easier to read than the King James. The problem is the King James scores lower than all the other other Bibles out there in grade level reading. The King James Bible reads at less than a fifth grade level. All the other Bibles read over a fifth grade level. So they lied to you. They're not making it easier to read. They're cha- well, anyway, they're changing the word so that they can get a copyright on it and sell it. We'll get to that. Amen. It says, as for the traditional pronouns, thou and thine, in reference to deity, the translators judged. Well, that's convenient. That to use these archaisms. Oh, that old King James. It's just so outdated. These and thou's. It's so hard to understand that. And yet that same group will sit at a table and they will praise Shakespeare full of these and thou's. And tell you that Shakespeare is the most beautiful production of the English language that's ever been. And they'll turn their nose up and say that King James Bible that was produced at the same time era in history is archaic. Somebody's not being honest. So, as for the traditional pronouns, thou and thine, the translators judge that to use these archaisms along with old verb forms such as doest, wouldest, and haddest, and that ending has a very important meaning, we'll talk about it, would violate accuracy in translation. (laughs) Neither Hebrew, Aramaic, nor Greek uses special pronouns for the persons of the Godhead, so we're just going to throw the Trinity out. That's what that means. A present translation is not enhanced by forms that in the time of the King James Version were used in everyday speech. In other words, we don't need that old English. We need something better. And they're the authority. Sometimes a variant Hebrew reading in the margin of the Masoretic text, and we'll talk about this. Listen, but just listen to this. Sometimes a variant reading in the margin. Okay, so not in the text of of the Hebrew, but a marginal note is what they're talking about. Sometimes a variant in the margin was followed instead of the text itself. Why would you do that? I'll hold my Schofield comment. Such instances being variants within the Masoretic tradition are not specified by footnotes. In rare cases, words in the consonal text were divided differently from the way they appear in the Masoretic text. They're telling you that they're changing the text based on what they think they need to do. It says, readings from uh, these versions were occasionally followed. Now listen, where the Masoretic text seemed doubtful. Well, who did it seem doubtful to? The people translating this version. And where accepted principles of textual criticism. Oh, there you go. Showed that one or more of these textual witnesses appeared to provide correct reading. And then it says, such instances are footnoted. Sometimes vowel letters and vowel signs did not end the judgment of the translators. 
And it says these instances are, not, are usually not indicated by footnotes. We don't have time to talk about the italics right now. I don't know how much more of this I'm going to read. It says where existing manuscripts differ, the translators made their choice of readings according to the accepted principles of textual criticism. Footnotes were uncertain. Where uncertainty about the original text was, the best current printed text of the Greek New Testament were used. And you'll see what the, ver- the problem with all that is. There's a sense in which the work of translators is never wholly finished. <laughs> you know, that's really convenient. To put a Bible version out there and say, you know what, this is the best we could do, but it's not really right. What does that do? It leaves it open for interpretation. But the King James Bible is definitive. Here it is. This is God's word in the English language. Here it is. It says, uh, suggestions for corrections, revisions that have been received from various sources and adopted a number of them. As in other ancient documents. Now listen to this. The precise meaning of the biblical texts is sometimes uncertain. Well, that makes you wonder what kind of scholar they are. If they can't determine what the text is saying, are they really as smart as they claim they are? Let's see, I'm not going to read that. I'm not going to read that. To achieve clarity, well, I'm not going to read that either, because we'll talk about that. All right. So here's what it says. Here's the last, the last thing. It says, like all translations of the Bible, made as they are by imperfect man, this one undoubtedly falls short of its goals. Then why do it? Why put it out there? It says, we pray that it will lead many to a better understanding of the Holy Scriptures and a fuller knowledge of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Word, of whom the Scriptures so faithfully testify except their Bible, which doesn't testify of Jesus Christ as much as the King James does. So anyway, that's, I know that was probably boring as I'll get out to you guys. That made my blood boil, so I thought we'd get that in there tonight and uh, hopefully be a good kickoff for next time. Okay, all right, next time we will talk about inspiration and preservation. Okay, and I, again, I hope this will be a help to you. I do not want to make this boring by any means. That is not my goal, but my goal is to help us understand what Satan is, is leveling in terms of an attack against the Bible and how to combat it, okay? All right, let's stand tonight.